Thank you for joining us all this morning. My name is Caitlin McLean, and I am an ORISE fellow doing research at NIOSH NPPTL, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health's National Personal Protective Technology Laboratory. Today's webinar concerns the study, the assessment of elastomeric respirators in healthcare delivery settings, routine elastomeric use and evaluations in healthcare, or reuse. Today's webinar will provide a brief overview on elastomeric half mask respirators which will be referred to as EHMRs during this webinar. And then we will be sharing the reuse study findings. First, I'll be providing a very brief introduction for NIOSH and PPTL and for EHMRs. And then I will go over the methods and background for the study. Finally, you'll hear from the three universities that we contracted to perform this study, Emory University, University of Texas at Houston, and Wayne State University, as they present their individual site findings from this study. In PPTL, or the National Personal Protective Technology Laboratory, is a division of NIOSH that focuses on personal protective technology. The vision of NPTL is to be the leading provider of quality, relevant, and timely personal protective technology research, training, and evaluation. The mission of the Personal Protective Technology Program and the National Personal Protective Technology Laboratory is to prevent work-related injury, illness, and death by advancing the state of knowledge and the application of personal protective technologies. As a disclaimer, the findings and conclusions in this presentation are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official position of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Mention of any company or product does not constitute endorsement by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. N95 and NIOSH approved our certification marks of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, registered with the United States and several international jurisdictions. The last American half mask respirators, or EHMRs, are tight fitting respirators made of synthetic or rubber material. The exact elastic material differs from brand to brand, but this type of material permits them to be repeatedly disinfected, cleaned, and redonned, which is a desirable trait in the healthcare setting. EHMRs can be equipped with replaceable filters or cartridges depending on the use environment and may have disposable components. At NIOSH, we've been exploring the use of EHMRs in healthcare since at least 2014. All respirators used during the course of the study were NIOSH approved and have an OSHA assigned protection factor or APF of 10, which is the same APF as an N95 filtering face piece respirator or FFR. EHMRs are designed for long-term use, which means they will be reused time and again and can be cleaned without damaging the respirator. For this study, the Honeywell RU8500-4 with P100 filter cartridges was used. It was chosen due to having desirable traits for the healthcare setting, including a speech diaphragm to facilitate clear communication, filter covers to protect the cartridges from potential splashes and sprays, and an exhalation diverter cover to prevent the user's exhaled breath from being directed at a patient. P100 filter cartridges were used as they come in hard plastic cartridge instead of an open pancake type filter, allowing them to be easily disinfected and more protected from splashes and sprays. The largest hurdle to switching to or banning use of EHMRs may be the fit test requirement. As these are tight fitting respirators, all workers who use them must be fit tested for that specific make, model, and size as per 29 CFR 1910-134, the respiratory protection standard. This ensures that respirator fits the user properly, thus providing the anticipated respiratory protection. As a note, this study was originally designed in 2017 and the first portion began implementation in 2018. So while respirator models have since come onto the market that are aimed at healthcare, the RU8500-4 model was kept for consistency throughout the project's lifespan. Also, due to hospital policy for con source control in 2022, when the final part of the study was implemented, all sites used halyard pediatric size procedure masks over the respirator's exhalation port for source control. Now that you have a little background on NIOSH and PPTL and EHMRs, I'll be going over the background and methods for the reuse study. This was a large project done in three parts over the course of five years, initially designed to explore what alternative respirators may be viable in a hospital setting should there be a shortage of FFRs. Part one was JetFit, or Just-in-Time Elastomeric Fit Test and Training. 
This looked at rapidly transitioning hospital staff to the EHMR, which meant training and fit testing done over a week period. Webinar presentations for JetFit were held in March of 2020 and February of 2021. Part two was response or randomized controlled elastomeric studies with PCR technology, disinfection safety and effectiveness. This looked at lab-based efficacy of different disinfectant wipes at removing bacteria and viruses that are common to a hospital setting from the Honeywell RU8500-4. It also looked at the efficacy in both time and load removal of different wiping methods when performed by healthcare personnel. The results of the study determined which wipe would be used in part three. The presentation for response was held in July 2023. Part three, reuse or routine elastomeric use and evaluations in healthcare is what we are presenting on today. The goal of reuse was to evaluate EHMRs in a hospital setting over a set time period. Three sites, Emory, Wayne State, and University of Texas, each recruited at least 100 healthcare personnel to use an EHMR for three months during patient care or whenever respiratory protection would normally be required over the course of their jobs. At a final count, 279 completed the study across all three sites. Some participants did per previously participate in part one jet fit as well. All participants were qualitatively fit tested, trained to use the EHMR, trained to care for the EHMR, including inspection, end of shift cleaning and storage, and then were trained to disinfect the EHMR using disinfectant wipes, either between patient encounters or when the healthcare personnel doffed the respirator if it was worn consecutively between patients. Over the course of the study, participants were given three types of surveys. A pre-survey study given after completing their training and fit testing, a bi-weekly survey, which was given every two weeks during the three-month study period, and a post-study survey given when the participant completed the three-month study period. Surveys were distributed via REDCap and were the same across all three sites. Participants were given the pre-study survey before they began their three-month period to establish a baseline of how they perceived EHMRs. The survey established the amount of respirator use they had prior to the study, what types of respirators they might have used, and questioned how the pandemic may have affected any prior use patterns. Also established was prior use of any other personal protective equipment types, comfort level, and knowledge base of the steps in using a respirator, and the participants' initial opinion on comfort, use, and reliability of EHMRs. Participants were given the bi-weekly survey every two weeks after beginning the three-month study period. These surveys recorded data such as the amount of respirator use per shift, if the healthcare personnel used a respirator other than the EHMR, such as an FFR, and why that might have been, how often they disinfected the EHMR after doffing, and if any problems were found with the disinfection wipes, such as access to the wipes, skin and or eye irritation, and time re required to complete the disinfection process. Also noted were comforts and discomforts while wearing the EHMR, such as heat buildup, skin irritation, strap discomfort, diff discomfort breathing, and et cetera. And if the EHMR interfered with performing notional, normal patient care tasks, we wanted to know what tasks those might have been, such as starting an IV or an A-line, taking vitals, intubation, physical exams, communication, and anything else. Once the three-month study was complete, participants were given the post-study survey. This survey included many of the same questions from the pre-study survey, so any changes in opinion and knowledge could be seen. Questions were also added to gauge how the healthcare personnel felt about EHMRs versus FFRs, now that they likely had experience with both types of respirators. These questions addressed topics such as use preference, comfort, and general usage. Also included were open answer questions where participants could write any other feedback from their time using EHMRs. Now that you have a general understanding of the background and methods for the study, I'm going to turn it over to the three presenters who will detail some of their site's results from the studies. First, you'll hear from Dr. Colleen Kraft of Emory University, then Dr. Lisa Pompey, who is representing the University of Texas at Houston. And to close it out, we'll hear from Dr. Yo Cheng Liu from Wayne State University. After all presenters have finished, we will have a question and answer session, beginning with the questions that were submitted on the registration page. If you do have a question during any of the presentations, please put it into chat and we will address them at the end.
Thank you so much, Caitlin. And I wanted to start with the Emory Reuse results. And you have the context of what this uh, was designed to achieve. And so um, I'm not going to restate a lot of the methods, but I will give you our results. As you know, um, this is this is a very interesting and now historical slide to me. Um, so at, in our hospital, at least, unless we're doing patient care, we're no longer wearing masks. But this was during the time when we were um, getting masks ready uh, early in the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 and trying to figure out how to disinfect them, which we've already talked about at a previous uh, webinar. Um, but this was uh, a way we were trying some UV light. So if if I think most of us are trying to not um, go back to this time um, in in healthcare um, healthcare care, um, but this was a time when we um, were trying out a bunch of different respirators. And one of the things I was very excited about as an infectious disease physician and as a hospital leader was that we actually were already involved in this study using AHMRs and that that was a very viable option for our staff. And, it, and I hope to convince you by the end that it's, it's going to continue to be a viable option for our staff going forward. Um, there's a lot of issues with the reuse of, of respirators. Um, I, I took a lot of pictures during this time, but I liked this one. You know, UV will disinfect respirators. I just showed you a picture of how we were trying to do that, which, by the way, we didn't do that for very long because it wasn't that effective. Um, we, um, but it will not remove stains um, like makeup. If makeup causes heavy soiling, then replace your mask. But this is the sort of way we are communicating this. And um, we are also making small marks on our N95s and different masks um, to show how many times they had been um, cleaned or reused. Um, we also were trying to employ various different methods, but as you know, none of these things could really scale. Um, so we tried PAPRs. We actually also had CAPRs on, on site. I'm not going to really talk about those today, but um, again, the availability of these and then the instructions on use made these sort of a limited option really for our healthcare center in the care of patients with COVID. So we really, um, again, we're grateful to be in this study, having already done sort of jet fit where we practiced even before there was a pandemic in a pandemic situation on how quickly we could train people on EHMRs. So now we got to, in the middle of a pandemic, um, actually see how this worked for our healthcare workers. So um, again, uh, really grateful to be part of this study and this work. Um, so we wanted to assess um, our healthcare experience with the implementation and use of EHMRs directly in their patient care. We wanted to, of course, see our feasibility, feasibility um, in, an, in, in some ways, our ex like acceptability. Um, we wanted to figure out the opinions of healthcare leadership on the feasibility at a larger scale, and then our hospital management's experience with um, implementation. So we were able at Emory um, Healthcare, uh, specifically at Emory University Hospital, to recruit 73 healthcare personnel. As Caitlin has already mentioned, um, we wore them with this pediatric mask um, as source control, uh, covering the exhalation valve whenever whenever it was used. And then also the use of these occurred whenever you would have used a N95 um, FFR instead. So you were basically substituting your N95 for this EHMR covered by the pediatric mask. We provided disinfection stations with Oxivir wipes and replacement parts on the units that worked under this inter intervention. And um, we restocked them as needed. And here's sort of a somewhat blurry picture, but of, of what it looked like in our hands. So we recruited from two hospital units within our hospital, the neurology, neurosurgery and neurology ICU. And we had an entire floor that was considered the care initiation unit caring for COVID-19 patients. We chose these because these um, staff groups tended to be very flexible and um, were very interested in trying new ways of being comfortable while caring for patients with COVID. Um, our unit leadership then on those two units were enrolled as super users um, and the nurses, nurses, aides and patient care assistants were recruited as participants. We think that's really important because not everybody spends the same amount of time in the room and not everybody does the same tasks. So we wanted to have as many individuals as possible with their tasks. Um, you've already learned from Caitlin, too, that we had a pre-survey on comfort, which I'm going to show you our pre and post um, survey data. We did five bi-weekly surveys, and then we did some open-ended feedback questions. 
So we had pretty good retention. Um, we ended up having um, 101 enrolled participants, 73 of who um, uh, finished. Uh, our post survey um, made it to about 72% of our initial enrollment. And so we are very grateful um, for the interest and um, enthusiasm of our participants. We, um, because they were all co-located co on a unit, it was easier for us to remind them to be taking these surveys, although they all worked at different times, obviously. Um, this uh, this demographic table, um, and this has been also um, submitted to um, ITCHI, uh, the Infection Control Hospital Epidemiology Journal. Um, you could see that we had um, uh, the most percentage of aged nurses and techs and patient care assistants uh, were in the 18 to 25 age. That's fairly um, something that we see a lot when we're doing research type studies is uh, that age range tends to have a lot of interest in participating. Um, we had um, the majority were female, which matches sort of our um, our workforce. Uh, we had a um, fairly diverse, um, uh, could have always been more diverse uh, group in terms of race, and uh, individuals could select more than one option. Um, so we had about um, our biggest two groups were um, Black or African American at 32% and white at 53%. Um, and the use of respirators prior to random, prior to the pandemic, 75% um, had obviously worn an N95. There were actually 18% that had not worn a respirator. And then um, we had a few that had worn EHMRs before, PAPRs. Um, I should remind you that we have a biocontainment unit on our campus. And so we train a lot in PAPRs. Um, and then you can see here the diversity of the job title. Um, most were nurses, but we did have um, some patient care assistants. And um, again, most worked in the ICU. So I really like this um, pre-study survey uh, slide because you can see here that it's pretty comfortable to begin with. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we are excited to do this work is because we um, already felt that this was something that could be achievable. And from our previous studies, we'd learned that this was something that people would accept. Um, and so some people thought it was extremely comfortable. And I will tell you that a lot of those individuals probably to this day are still wearing EHMRs in our healthcare system. So through all the tasks that we asked them about, um, they considered this to be quite comfortable. Um, if you look at the post-study survey, so after you've worn it for a number of weeks, um, you could see that it actually becomes something that they get more used to and they find it extremely comfortable. So that was exciting to us to see that that change and that sort of um, increased acceptance based on such a positive res response on the pre-survey comfort. Um, individuals spent a lot of different um, hours, so some of them that were enrolled did not wear it. Um, some in, uh, that were involved wore it um, most of the time was, you know, about one to three hours, um, and that tapered off. We did have some individuals that wore it um, for greater than 11 hours, which would have been um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of time um, it, it wearing that mask. Um, we uh, surveyed the healthcare leadership focus groups. My role at Emory is as an associate chief medical officer, and this was very important to me to understand sort of all the perspectives of how we would want to do this. So we had asked in our focus groups, given the resources required for the deployment of EHMRs as part of this feasibility study, do you believe it would be feasible to deploy EHMRs throughout the healthcare system? And obviously, it um, you know it all centered really around uh, availability. I think the other thing we're working on now with so much turnover in our staff is trying to figure out who can train individuals any longer. So we've lost a lot of our trainers and a lot of our methods and staff to be able to train people and fit test. And so it's something that we're actually actively working on as a healthcare system. Um, we also have a robust um, uh, relationship with our M uh, health and safety office. And so we thought a lot about how EHMRs would fit in with the respiratory protection program. Um, and so our responses included, you know, plans for a rollout given the limited amounts, we would essentially have them it be, you know, sort of the third choice. So if they couldn't get fit tested on the 3M or the halyard that we were, that we're currently using, they would then go to the EHMR. Um, and 
uh, we think that you know this additional respirator to offer to our staff really helps our sustainability as everyone sort of struggled with especially early in the pandemic and um you know, especially in situations and, you know, some of the examples that Caitlin showed were in uh, individuals in non-healthcare roles, um, thinking about other situations where you may um, have to wear PPE all day, not just intermittently as you go into a patient room. Um, some feedback, um, we uh, uh, took all this very seriously. Um, a participant felt like they had to shout, and so we we would recommend sort of improving that speech diaphragm. This is something we worried about from the very beginning, since um, even with a regular mask, you can't really see um, or, or lip read if you need to lip read. Um, we uh, added a notch uh, in the nose piece if individuals uh, felt that there was more fogging up. And many times it wasn't that it was fogging up, it was just that your glasses were sort of displaced. So thinking about how we might fix that. Um, Obviously, a recommendation of a less bulky design since it looks at times sort of imposing. And I think there's probably no better time to try this study than during a pandemic when everybody was wearing a lot of personal protective equipment. Some of it was very, very bulky. Um, but again, in terms of trying to like get it seamlessly into clinical care, that was something um, that there was a concern. And then um, the cleaning process um, for some individuals was uh, too long, especially if you clean between between the patient. We had a very specific way that we had validated to clean. Um, and so I think it's one of those things where trying to figure out how to be prepared as you clean in your workflow processes so you don't um, have to do it quickly or you don't have to rely on doing it quickly. So we had um, uh, a an, uh, fairly large number of healthcare providers. Uh, EHMR was warned for patient care during a public health emergency. Um, we deployed them um, again for the overall study as you're about to see the other two facilities. And we only use one model of EHMR, which some, it could be a strength or a limitation. I think at least trying to figure out if that type of, of, of EHMR for our location would actually be able to help individuals um, be comfortable and um, it be sustainable. And something that is similar to all the other ones around it was actually there's some benefits to having one model. The limitations would be that it'd be nice to, to test other models, but this is the one we had chosen far before the pandemic. So we had um, actual actual um, uh, inventory of that. And so um, in, in many of our surveys, um, we felt that nurse, nurses and unit leadership really did prefer the EHMR for themselves over an N95 because of its perceived higher protection, improved comfort, and, and um, because of the support of the healthcare system. Um, deployment was really considered to be successful. Uh, nurses responded that they would like to continue and there are still some that continue to wear this um, during when airborne precautions are warranted. And um, for our participants, they were allowed to keep the EHMR, um, but they felt that it was difficult to get um, back to sort of that little, we used to have that station that they could disinfect them. So trying to figure out how to make that a more universal um, practice in our hospital if we continue to support the use of these. And we've been thinking about masks for a long time, so um, I just thought I'd stick in this uh, old time mask look. And um, we really appreciate the opportunity to participate and share our information with you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lisa Pompey, and I have co-led this study at the University of Texas with my colleague Janelle Rios. Um, I've also listed the other members of our research team here. Um, we conducted this study at a tertiary care medical center in Houston, Texas. Um, the healthcare workers um, for our part of the study that were eligible to be to be included had to be at least 18 years of age, provide direct patient care, in-person counseling or case management uh, with patients. They had to be previously fit tested to wear a respirator in the prior two years. Um, and have no facial hair, no facial injuries or adornments. They had to be medically cleared per OSHA, for the OSHA medical evaluation questionnaire, so Appendix C, um, and they, they did not have a, a decrease or absence of smell or taste. And so we targeted our recruitment to healthcare providers um, that provided care in units more likely to care for patients with known or suspected aerosol transmissible diseases, um, so we targeted the emergency department, 
a range of critical care units and then some designated acute COVID-19 units. Um, because of COVID, we were not allowed to enter uh, the hospital to recruit um, uh, participants. Um, and so all of our recruitment efforts occurred online. Uh, workers were sent an email invitation from their managers that included a red cap link to our online recruitment um, web page. This included an informational video about the study. They were informed of um, they were informed that they would be asked to wear their elastomeric respirator at times when the use of their, their already fit tested N95 uh, filtering face piece respirator would be warranted. Um, they were going to be followed for three months, asked to complete seven online surveys. They would be incentivized up to $450, depending on the number of surveys they completed. And then um, on the recruitment page, they completed an inclusion a questionnaire, uh, they completed the OSHA medical evaluation form, a study consent form, and then they signed up for fit testing and a training session. The training session occurred at the study hospital. Workers received a drawstring bag, I have that illustrated here, that included their EHMR and written instructions. Um, they then watched a training video on how to use the EHMR they were fit tested and then trained in person on how to disinfect um, the respirator. Um, and we used Oxivir wipes for that. I believe that was what was used across all study sites that was recommended. Um, they then completed a baseline uh, survey right there at uh, the, re the fit testing site. And then they received an, an initial uh, incentive for that participation. So as we indicated before, participants were followed for three months and asked to complete a survey every two weeks, which included the RCOMFI questionnaire, which is a validated questionnaire pertaining to the aspects of respirator comfort, or really they ask about the discomfort. Um, work workers were also asked about the hours of their use, the ease of disinfecting the respirator, how they carried and stored their respirators, and what they liked and disliked about the respirators. Over the three months, um, we had 110 workers that stayed in the study um, out of 112 that were recruited. They were employed in various occupations and across numerous work units. So we had you know, a very nice range of nurses, PT, OT, respiratory therapists, et cetera, across four or five different areas. And then we also had um, a large cadre of workers that floated from area to area. Um, or unit to unit, which was great to have them in there because they had different challenges with respect to storing their respirator, carrying it, and disinfecting it. Um, so at study week 10, and I chose to look at differences between weeks 2 and 10, um, just because that was kind of the bookends of these biweekly surveys. So at study week 10, more than half of the participants indicated they wore their respirators one to three hours in the prior two weeks. Um, with the second longest time period being one to two um, hour, continuous hours of use. When asked about performing specific tasks while wearing the respirator, more than half indicated they had difficulty communicating um, with patients. And so that was really kind of the significant issue that workers uh, complained about with the use of the EHMR. However, less than one fourth indicated having problems with other types of tasks, such, such as walking and repositioning the patient, as well as administering oxygen. Few indicated um, problems with other tasks list, listed here, such as bathing and feeding the patient, taking vital signs or dressing the patient. In addition, only a small percentage indicated having di difficulty performing tasks listed here, such as um, performing tracheostomy care, oral suctioning, and blood draws. We examined changes in respirator comfort level among participants that indicated that they wore the respirator at week two and week 10. And so we had 83 participants that were wearing at both those time periods. And we observed that some comfort measures improved between the two time periods, such as facial heat, facial irritation, and tightness of straps. Um, those that improved slightly while nose pinching uh, uh, continue to be um, a problem and actually more reported it as a discomfort in week 10. Similarly, workers reported less discomfort with the lack of fresh air, interference with glasses, 
experiencing headache and frustration, overall frustration with wearing at week 10 compared to week two. Um, discomfort measures were similar across time periods for week two and week 10, um, but overall were low at both time periods, including interference with patient duties, obstructed vision, and effective concentration. Um, again, the one issue, and we asked it in two different ways that was consistently stood out was verbally communicating while wearing the elastomeric respirator. When asked about patients and workers' perception of the elastomeric respirator, a small proportion, less than 10%, indicated that coworkers reacted neg negatively to the respirator, while approximately 20% at, at week two and 13% at week 10 indicated that patients reacted neg negatively. With regard to disinfecting the elastomeric respirator, 85% indicated that they typically disinfect their respirator after use. Um, reported problems with EHMR disinfection included not having access to the wipes, uh, the disinfection took too long, and the wipes irritated their face, their hands, or their lungs. We asked workers where they stored their respirator between use, with more than half indicating that they stored it in their office or their locker. One third indicated that they carried the bag with them or they carry the respirator with them in the bag that we provided. And so we we gave them these bags with, for the purpose of having them carry them. And so some people used it, but then again, some people didn't. And so storing their respirator away from them while they're providing patient care um, is certainly a barrier to having it easily accessible and using it. Um, when asked about future elastomeric respirator use, a large proportion indicated that they felt comfortable doing so during the remainder of the pandemic and also in non-pandemic conditions, as well as feeling comfortable recommending the EHMR to their colleagues. So overall, the elastomeric respirator um, we felt was really positively received. Uh, when asked what they liked best about the respirator, some indicated that it was more comfortable than the filtering face piece respirator, the N95. They felt it was less wasteful and more sustainable, and they felt that it, it provided greater protection. Even though it's the same um, APR, they just felt uh, that they were more protected. When asked what they didn't like, some indicated that the cleaning process was tedious, including the drying time and then finding a space um, to actually clean. Um, some indicated that it was difficult to communicate with others, as I previously indicated. It was too bulky or heavy, it was hot, and they had trouble wearing it with their glasses. Um, we asked workers why they chose to participate, and some were interested in finding a respirator that works best for healthcare workers. Um, they were hoping that the elastomeric would provide more protection and comfort than the uh, N95. Uh, they wanted to help with the sort shortage of the N95s, or they were hoping it would help with that, and that they would have more respirator options to choose from. Some limitations of, of our research, um, we did not have access to the study hospital. Um, our research team isn't employed by that hospital, so we, we weren't physically inside there to be able to get in and talk to workers, which was really different than um, our initial first step of the jet fit where we rapidly fit tested and trained workers. We were able to go to team meetings and talk to workers and recruit them, and we weren't able to do that um, during the pandemic. Um, so our recruitment options were a bit limited. Um, we were unable to directly assess their actual use of the elastomeric respirator. When, when were they using it and actually talk to them about their use on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, we weren't able to set up elastomeric disinfection stations on each of the units, and that actually, I think, would have fostered um, the process of disinfection to some degree. And we weren't able to ensure their access to the Oxivir wipes, and we found at times that that was a problem, um, and we had to do a lot of workarounds to make sure that they had those. So in conclusion, uh, we found that the EHMR was a suitable alternative to the N95 filtering face piece respirator. Workers were able to conduct most of the basic care and procedural tasks wearing the elastomeric. Workers were comfortable wearing it in the pandemic and indicated they would also wear it in non-pandemic conditions. And again, communication was a significant barrier warranting the need for an improved EHMR design. So I'll go ahead and end there and turn this over to Emery.
Okay, let me get started. Uh, this is uh, uh, overall study, part of the overall study called assessment of elastomeric respirators in healthcare delivery settings. So that was uh, introduced by Caitlin earlier. So our group uh, was the uh, third side. And uh, we're mostly located in the School of Medicine here at Wayne State University. But uh, Dr. Mark Rosenson and Dr. Rob, Robert Sherwin, uh, both uh, MDs in emergency department, emergency medicine here in the School of Medicine, as well as at the Sinai Grace Hospital, the study hospital. And uh, Jasmine is my research uh, coordinator, and uh, Dr. Jinping Xu here, uh, uh, our department chair, also my assistant manager. I serve as the PI and the project manager. Okay, so you have uh, heard about the uh, baseline data from uh, Dr. Kraft and also uh, bi-weekly data comforts and others uh, during the study, the three months follow up. So our focus here is the predictors, uh, what the factors affect the comfort, the barriers, the use, frequency, the cetera. But in general, there's a research gap here in terms of comfort, discomfort, symptoms, or use barriers, uh, because uh, elastomeric half mask respirators are widely used in general industry. And uh, in healthcare organizations, they are not very familiar with this kind, especially healthcare workers. So research uh, is limited in terms of uh, in uh, health healthcare setting. So CDC and IRH MPTLs study was in time and right before the pandemic when we conducted the first part of the study, which was jet fit and uh, you know, training and fit testing that was right before the pandemic. And actually the pandemic came to Seattle. So we used that as the simulation. Originally, we're going to think about you know how to simulate it, but in fact, the pandemic just again. So it was real. Everybody uh, in a study hospital was uh, kind of uh, afraid. You know what? What are we going to do about it? So here we talk about the second project, which was the actual use for three months. But in terms of objectives here, we focus on the feasibility, meaning that uh, can we ask them to use them in patient care for three months? And originally it was six months use, but it might be too long. So it changed to three months. So feasibility is first and thing, uh, you know, their experience, how they like it and any uh, discomfort, use of barriers, or symptoms during the use. And uh, frequency, of course, you know, how many hours on a daily basis they can use it is also the key because if the engineering control and the others cannot help much, you know, especially during the pandemic, you know, we have to use the respirator, you know, the more you use it, the better. But uh, we don't know how often they use it. So in terms of recruitment, at our side, we approach the different units, uh, mostly focused on the uh, ED, emergency medicine or department. But I see use the CQ, NICU, I mean the NICU, CQ, no NICU. Uh, so they are all part of it. Besides, we have uh, other units involved, such as psychiatry. And in terms of recruitment measures, we conducted it uh, 
later than the other two sides. So pandemic was almost over last year. So me and my research assistants, we went to different departments, especially ED and uh, sick Niku. I met Niku. I tend to like Niku somehow because I did a uh, paper study earlier in Niku. In any case, uh, so we used various uh, approaches. Uh, we talked to the uh, nurses station uh, nurses, uh, we went to their lunch rooms, so we put the flyers everywhere in the hospital, especially the lunch room. And uh, we also asked them to, you know, tell their colleagues, you know, about our study. Anybody interested, please call us. So here, uh, my research assistant, Pretty, and the research assistant here is Hafsar, and this is me. And this is the lunch room. Everybody was excited when we came back. You know, we told them that we had a second project going to come up, come up, but because of the pandemic, for three years, we were not able to go. And the hospital didn't allow us to go. So we waited and waited eventually. The pandemic was uh, almost over. We went there and they were happy to join us. So here are some of the uh, uh, wear pictures in the conference room. This is the conference room, and this is the lunch room. So in the conference room, we trained them and we tested them. And uh, by weekly survey of the discomfort and the use time symptoms and the use of barriers interference with their patient care work, is our focus, uh, you know. So discomfort, so we had a, a same questionnaire, you know, across the uh, three sides, um, similar as Dr. Pompey talked about, but that, that include uh, uh, 12 uh, discomforts and seven symptoms altogether is 19. So this is to, it, this is a kind of uh, to ask them questions in a negative way. For example, how often did the wearing the elastic respirator in the past two weeks cause the dis um, cause the discomfort, affect your comfort? So this is negative. So the answer if uh, is uh, you know true is no good. All the time is discomfortable. If it's zero, it's good. So remember the score system, system here, you know, the higher, the bad, the worse. The barrier is the interference with patient care, seven items. So this is uh, not a zero to two, but a one to four. Agree or strongly disagree or strongly agree. Again, this is a, a negative uh, a statement. So strongly agree means, uh, you know, worse. Okay, so we also surveyed the uh, use frequency or daily hours of use. So this uh, classification of four categories is the same as the other two sides. So in terms of uh, statistical analysis, we consider this as, uh, you know, uh, different uh, categories. So we use the chi-square to examine the uh, differences of uh, all the data across the six uh, biweekly surveys. And uh, the analysis on the discomfort symptoms and barrier scores, so here, as I explained uh, in the previous uh, slides, it's a score. So we calculate uh, first the mean score and the standard deviation across the six bi-weekly surveys to see if they are different. Because uh, we were assuming that in the beginning, maybe it was uh, not comfortable. And after a while, they get uh, adapted. You know, so in fact, and that's not the case. I'll talk about it later. 
So no difference across the six bioweekly surveys. But we also calculate the total score, you know, adding everything together. Uh, you know, uh, uh, 12 plus 7, uh, 19 items. So you have the graded score for each one and add it together, how much is the total. So that total can be used as a separate indicator. But in terms of uh, the uh, predictors and the analysis across the six spike weekly surveys, all uh, categorized by the, demo, the, the, uh, the uh, demographic uh, characteristics we used the ANOVA. But we also used the multiple regression, regression to try to identify the significant predictors. So what do we found in terms of results? First, uh, discomfort that included also the symptoms. So age is a predictor, you know, uh, younger age and the more discomfort. BMI uh, body mass index somehow on the lower end had a higher discomfort. And education obviously is, uh, as you can see here on the second chart, you know, the highest bar is high school, you know, less education, more education, more comfort, less education, less comfort. And on the left uh, is the occupation. So the nurses um, and the patient care assistant had a higher discomfort than others. Okay, so continue. Um, the discomfort score, uh, respirator use experience uh, is uh, very important. Uh, so uh, you see, uh, if you have uh, um, less years, fewer years, like zero to two years of uh, experience, which means less experience, you have a higher discomfort. Uh, there is also a high bar here which is for seven, uh, I mean, six to 10 years use, it's also high. In fact, it's the highest, but we don't know why. Uh, respirator well time, uh, four to six hours a day showed the most discomfort. And uh, in terms of barrier, Barrier scores, uh, this is a multiple regression. So from less than one hour to six hours, you see the p-value of all less than uh, 0 0.05. That means the re regression coefficient are significant. That means they are predictors. But the higher hours are not significant. But uh, that is uh, the uh, respirator well time. But the race and uh, education is also uh, also predictors for barriers. We talked about them in the discomfort scores, but here barrier scores had uh, fewer uh, variables than the uh, discomfort score. His confidence scores had more variables that affected. Okay, so this is a summary. Basically, it's the same statement as I explained earlier. So earlier, I had presented uh, statistical results, but in fact, we also have some notes uh, here, you know, uh, not statistically, you know, summarized, just based on notes. So let me try to read it. Wearing some form of the facial covering was hospital policy during the study. So EHNO wear time per day did not show significant change over time. Basically, during the three months, all uh, six by weeks, they, you know, they are pretty much stable. And in fact, they are pretty similar 
uh, to what Dr. Kraft and uh, Dr. Pompey presented. And uh, in terms of uh, the uh, whole work shift, uh, it's uh, higher in our side. I think it's a uh, 20 percent, you know, almost like one third, use the uh, whole shift. But uh, three out of 20, you know, they decided, you know, not to use it for the whole shift, especially not seeing patients, you know, working on the computers. They don't like to wear this kind of respirator. So, in terms of reasons, not when the EHMR, sometimes they said, you know, I left them at home, I forgot, I forgot to bring it. Uh, the cleaning and disinfection, we used the same uh, wipe. Uh, the other two sites uh, identified called the Exvia. And uh, they liked the Exvia uh, very much. Uh, in fact, they convenient to use, so we gave them one container, you know, we bought everybody one container. So that was uh, enough uh, for them to use. But in fact, the hospitals also had their own uh, uh, each, uh, unit. Probably was a uh, different type. But that was used to clean the benches, you know, not the skin. Uh, so if uh, they were running out of our container uh, wipes, uh, we asked them to use their hospitals. But there was uh, variations, you know, in terms of uh, cleaning. So the next uh, several slides was uh, focused on the management of the uh, respirator. Uh, I mean, the res respiratory protection program in general, and uh, EHMR in particular. Although, you know, during the three months, uh, they didn't really formally, you know, manage our respirator. But this is uh, from one focus group meeting. Uh, the attendants were healthcare workers. No um, administrators. We were supposed to assemble administrators, uh, but the most administrators, over 20 of them, of them were assembled uh, for the second meeting. But uh, EMC, EMC, Detroit Medical Center, was uh, silent with the hospital's overhead. You know, uh, they were in the same center. So somehow, although we got uh, their IRB approval, but the uh, compliance office somehow uh, tried to block the second meeting because they didn't want any administrators involved in the research. Uh, they said it's okay, you know, for healthcare workers to participate in a study. But uh, uh, we needed to ask our legal team. So eventually they, they never got back to us. So here, uh, most of it summarized was from, again, five healthcare workers. In terms of management, uh, they didn't have a department of occupational health. So each respirator program was managed by each unit individually. So these managers are mostly nurses, you know, sometimes infection control officers. Therefore, purchase and the distribution was built in the base. So you don't have, to, you don't have large copies to distribute and you know, centrally purchase. So in terms of storage, uh, I mean, mostly probably N95. So they have uh, their unit to manage and whoever needs the N95. They can ask their unit, you know, nurse manager 
to purchase that for them. And then the nurse manager is going to report or obtain the approval, the you know, higher level approvals. So that's uh, for the so the next one is continued on the storage. So the storage uh, basically had some suggestions. Uh, they don't like really N95, you know, centrally managed or stored. So they like to manage and take care of it themselves. But they suggested, you know, a safe place, you know, easy to access close to their workplace would be beneficial, you know, or storage, a cabinet, or something like that. So in terms of training, it's also unit-based cleaning. Uh, I think mostly uh, they provided some suggestions for our respirator. So they said, that, you know, uh, the uh, NIOSH tested uh, oxidia uh, wipe or as good as in disinfection. Although uh, that one cost probably cost uh, one healthcare worker uh, to have a dark spot on the facial skin. So somehow that uh, was the case. So we stopped her from continuation and later her spot on the facial skin faded, you know, a couple of weeks later. She said it was uh, our uh, wipe. We don't know exactly. But in terms of cleaning, they had a good suggestion, you know, like a dishwash liquid, you know, start cleaning first before you do the disinfection. Okay. We also asked them about filter change, although we told them based on our obtained message from NIOSH, probably the HEPA filters uh, on the elastomeric mask respirator can be good for one year because in the hospital in the air, they don't have a lot of dust and are pretty clean and the virus uh, particles or fungi, et cetera, uh, not many in the air. Uh, but uh, how exactly they can do the filter change? So they have very good suggestions. And they said, you know, if you provide them free, you're going to use a lot. Uh, so basically, it would be good for yearly fit testing, you know, to change it. So there are other suggestions, uh, you know, highlighted here. I'm not, not going to go over all of them. But uh, in terms of conclusion, I think we reached a pretty similar conclusions as uh, Dr. Kraft and Dr. Pompey. Uh, mostly EH MRs are uh, pretty comfortable. And uh, that can be um, can be told from the statistical results. All the negatives are, you know, um, on the you know zero side, you know, less the uh, barrier, less discomfort side. That means it's not a big problem. Occasionally, you could have communication problem, you could have other issues, but it's all um, close to zero in any case. Uh, we concluded that the conversion to the use of EHMR is to consider some risk factors or predictors we identified, such as demographics, you know, education, and the training, of course, is very important before you uh, try to convert the use of this respirator. Implications, I think uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, mostly, I think it's a uh, good support to current NIOSH. I mean, probably NIOSH uh, changed the recommendation, but during the pandemic, 
it was uh, one of the uh, recommended uh, alternative respirators, along with pepper. You know, uh, if you run out of N95, uh, you can use this one. Why not? You know, they are probably available from Home Depot, but nobody from the hospital knows. You know, so they don't buy them. Okay, so we very much thank NIOSH uh, for the support, and uh, we really appreciate uh, you know NIOSH, including our side. Although I, our side was always falling behind, uh, kind of late, but eventually we uh, did uh, very good, and uh, we recruited a similar number of uh, participants uh, for this study. We consented 117, and we had 70 participating. We finished 68, uh, although not uh, everybody had every, you know, uh, survey sale, you know, filled out. So, but uh, the total number are pretty good. So we uh, thank all the healthcare workers as well as the hospital. Uh, administrators for the support, especially DMC IRB approval. Okay, so this is my contact information and email is yuchenliu.edu. I'm in the family medicine and public health science. My training is in mental health industrial hygiene. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Thank you very much all to our presenters for all of the information they have shared today. Uh, now we're going to move on to the question and answer session. We have about 15 to 20 minutes for that. So I'm going to start with the questions that were initially submitted uh, during registration. So one, uh, first question that I'll address from the uh, registration questions was, was the use of elastomeric respirators in the perioperative setting evaluated in this study. Um, so not specifically. No, 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 I can answer that and maybe Colleen can too. We actually uh, didn't go into the perioperative setting and we didn't do it because there was a risk of exposure to the sterile field. So we did have pediatric masks that went over the exhalation valves, but at least in our study hospital, the, uh, the infection control uh, leaders just didn't feel comfortable with us using them in the OR, so we didn't. We explored using it with endoscopy because um, it would be a little bit easier about sort of without having to con be concerned about the patient's, um, you know, sort of feedback. Uh, that's some of the questions I've been answering in the chat. Um, so, but again, because we had sort of COVID um, areas of care, we sort of kind of pivoted towards that. But we did think about endoscopy because it wouldn't have the sterile issues that Dr. Pompey is um, uh, talking about, and then it wouldn't have the patient perception. So we could talk about, we could study in a different way how in, how the communication between healthcare providers could be impaired or not impaired by the use of those. Dr. Liu, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I didn't hear the question. I didn't pay attention. Could you repeat the question? Um, was the use of the EHMRs in the perioperative setting actually evaluated in the study? So what different departments were you recruiting from? Oh, yeah, uh, that was in my slide. Uh, we recruited uh, quite a few, uh, so mostly the emergency department, because they are, you know, uh, Dr. Mark Rosenthal is in charge of their public health disaster response team. So as an emergency department, they often need to respond quickly to public health disasters like a pandemic. But ICU was also our favorite. You know, they were active uh, in uh, both uh, Chetapit and the views studies. They actively participated, and quite a few were from the first study. Thank you. Uh, next question was, can a port account be used to complete the annual fit testing for these respirators? And the answer to that is yes. So yeah. both the qualitative and quantitative fit tests work for the elastomeric respirators. 
Uh, next question was who does the sanitizing, the individual wear or a dedicated facility station? Uh, and th this actually falls down to hospital policy. So for this study, all three sites had the individual be responsible for storing and cleaning and inspecting their respirators. There are other hospitals, however, who have a central disinfection station where hospital workers actually drop off their respirators at the end of a shift and pick it up at the start of their shift. So at this point, it's all hospital based decisions. Uh, would uh, anyone like to chime in? Dr. Kraft, Dr. Pompey, Dr. Liu? Um, the only thing I want to add to that is that um, Emory was in a unique situation and that their study population was on like two or three very designated areas. It was a little bit more confined and controlled and they were able to set up disinfection stations where we weren't able to do that. And we had a lot of workers that floated from place to place. So they carried their um, disinfection supplies with them or we kept them on designated units. And I do think that that was a bit of a barrier. Some of them complained that they just didn't have the space to do it. So um, I do think when, when we followed up later with some of the managers and we asked them like, do you have space? Some units said that they would have had space to disinfect and others didn't. Um, and so I, I do think that's something that organizations need to think about when they move forward on uh, if they are going to have the worker do that themselves, that they've got it, uh, they've got a method to set that up and a, a place for them to do that. I mean, Colleen, do you have something to add to that? No, I just would say that if we had done ours in the emergency department, we wouldn't have had space to disinfect. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think everything you said makes, makes a lot of sense. I think in general, we're trying to figure out if there's a better way to interact with PPE from a supply chain aspect, like even um, Jill Morgan on our team is really interested in a vending machine type thing where um, there can be some accountability about who's taking it out, but also there can be an aspect of it has to be cleaned before it gets put into that machine. And so this would not work well with, with this study, but I think in general, trying to figure out like how how you set that up and supply your staff with disinfection is much harder than 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 you think it is. So I think I'm glad that you brought that up, Dr. Pompey, in your in your um, narrative. Uh, I was like to focus on the disinfection with the uh, elastomeric respirator during the study. So basically, we gave them the container that had the auxiliary wipes, and they tried to use it. But uh, we didn't, uh, you know, in the focus group meeting, we didn't ask them about their N95 disinfection, you know, centralized or individualized. We didn't focus on that. So I think the questionnaire probably uh, doesn't have a con that a component uh, either. Uh, basically, we were not sure about the N95. But for this uh, respirator, during our study, everybody was using the uh, CDC tested uh, Oxivia. But as I said earlier, they have their own uh, surface cleaning wipes, uh, which uh, uh, they showed me a pretty similar container, but uh, I'm not sure what they used was tested, you know, uh, what was the logic behind for their selection, we don't know. And I do want to just chime in with what you said. These were not necessarily CDC tested wipes that we used. These were wipes that we tested in a prior portion of this study and decided to use the Oxivir 1 or the Oxivir TB wipes, which had a 0.5% uh, H2O2 as a disinfectant. Um, next registration question was resistance to fit testing healthcare workers with facial hair and the requirement to be clean shaven. Uh, were there any issues with that? Uh, there was a requirement at recruiting that no participants could actually participate in the study if they were, would not stay appropriately clean shaven as that does go against respirator use guidance. So that is just something that everyone who is implementing respirator use or respirator program needs to be aware of that 
you cannot use a respirator and not be clean shaven or, or have appropriate small uh, appropriate facial hairstyles as shown by NIOSH uh, infographics. I think in terms of participating in our studies, the two projects, uh, both uh, studies, I had experience, you know, uh, quite a few talking to me. They are interested, uh, but they, not, they are not eligible. But they told us when you have this pepper, you know, study, you know, coming, please let me know. I would be interested in participating. Um, okay, so we're down to the questions from chat. Uh, one of the First questions was what model pediatric face mask was used for source control? Uh, that was the Halyard procedure mask uh, for pediatrics. I think it was aged four to 12. And we ended up using that after some just minor testing to make sure what types of procedure masks may or may not impair breathing resistance. So that was the one we ended up using for ease, ease of use and comfort of users. Uh, next question, did the EHMR have an accessory option for built-in exhalation valve filter? And if so, did it meet the hospital requirement for source control? So this exact model does not. This model was chosen at the beginning of the study back in 2017, 2018, and we kept it for consistency throughout the lifespan of the study. However, over the last two to three years, many different designs have come onto the market, market to address source control, and those will be addressed in future studies. But at the time of this study design, the source control was addressed by using the exhalation diverter valve, which just directed the exhaled breath at the wearer's chest and away from the patient's breathing zone. Uh, there was a question directed at UT. Lisa, I saw that you had answered at least part of it. Uh, what, the, what was the drawstring bag, bag made of? And were oh. workers given any instructions on maintaining the bag? Yeah, I can answer that. So. The bag was cottony. It was almost like a linen. Um, they were instructed to wash it, um, to keep it clean. If they put a dirty respirator in there, then they needed to wash it. What we did find, though, um, and we should have tested this beforehand, that some workers complained later that it left like cotton fibers on the outside of the mask. So if they threw the mask in there when it was wet and it wasn't totally dry, when they brought it out, it was it was wet. So then in a follow-up study that wasn't a CDC study, we ended up, and I've got it here, I'll just show you. So if you're interested, we use this type of bag that is washable, it's breathable, but it also has an inside pocket or an outside pocket. And what we learned talking to some of the workers was they wanted to be able to walk out of the room if the respirator was dirty, that they could put it in the front pocket where it was dirty and then later clean it and then stick it on the inside pocket. But then they were also instructed to uh, regularly wash their their bag in the wash machine. But for that initial study, they were instructed, they got written instructions on what to do with that bag and how to manage it. So I just would suggest if you're going to do this, stay away from a cotton bag. We had no idea that that would be an issue. So, Lisa, if you were trying to show the bag, your camera is off. Well, I'm showing that I can see me. Can you not see me? No. Oh. I can see you. Okay. Um, it's just that she has a blurred background, so it was hard to see the bag. So, oh, here. So here's the bag. It's just, a, you know, it's a plasticky, like athletic bag. It's still drawstring. And then it's got a front pocket, too. It's got an outside pocket. So the workers, this was a different study. When they walked out of the room, they put their dirty respirator in the front. So if they were quickly going off to the next thing, they didn't have to stop and clean the respirator then. And then once it was cleaned, it went into the inside of the big bag, the big pocket of the bag. So anyway, that was it. It wasn't super fancy. It's simple, but we just changed it up. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Kaff or Dr. Liu, did you have similar findings? Or do you we, similar we didn't do this. No, we didn't do the okay. same. Um, so they ended up just... Um, Putting it in their locker in their in their break room. Yes, sometimes uh, they took it, took the respirator to their car and they lived it there because uh, probably uh, they didn't want to contaminate their locker or home. You know, uh, they. I think uh, that was the case uh, for the participant who had the dark 
uh, spark you know, to be her skin because you know she probably didn't uh, wait until the wet uh, liquid uh, evaporated uh, you know before using it. So I think uh, somehow the wet liquid on the skin was not good. Lisa, it does look like there's a little bit of a follow-up question. Did they bring the bag into the, I guess, the patient rooms with them at all? Yeah, they did. So they carried that with them, just like they would carry a stethoscope or any of their other equipment. They weren't instructed to keep the bag outside. All right, next question. As communication continues to be a major factor during use of the EHMR, did any sites continue or consider or trial use of some form of throat microphone or other communications enhancement? So no extra accessories like microphones were used. However, I believe it was noted that some workers used pen and paper or whiteboard if communication was seriously impacted. Yeah, so at Emory, we have tried to use these types of microphones in our biocontainment unit um, with our PAPRs. Um, that's where we've had the most concern. And so um, we've not found a solution that's scalable. It would be um, it would be uh, especially for the biocontainment unit because you can't take that thing in and out like it has to be in there. So um, we we did not think about doing that because we haven't sort of solved our original problem. But I, I do think it's important. Um, but in terms of like Bluetooth and we've messed around with all sorts of things in our biocontainment unit, Bluetooth stethoscopes, the feedback, the issue with the other um, devices in the hospital room. Um, I'm waiting for somebody to come up with a really cool uh, device for this? I think uh, communication wasn't rated very high on our, you know, study scale as, uh, you know, a barrier. Uh, but when I was trying to attend their hurdle meetings in the morning or in the evening and, uh, you know, try to tell people our study, ask them to participate, they couldn't hear me. Uh, so later, I didn't use this uh, respirator. I just used the NIV5. Uh, probably NIV5 uh, is more communicable, uh, but I think it's not a big problem. People just need to talk louder. And for me, I think it's the language barrier issue rather than, you know, sound volume. Dr. Pompey, did you have anything to add? I don't have anything to add. We didn't do any augmentation of uh, the voice piece because if I recall correctly, that form of Honeywell had some type of voice box in it, but I didn't really find that that helped at all. It, it but no, we didn't, we've never tried anything else. Thank you. The next question. Did anyone consider comparing the incidence of respiratory, respiratory illness in the population of workers who wore the FFRs versus those who wore EHMRs versus no respiratory protection? So this was strictly a study to look at comfort and feasibility of using an elastomeric in the healthcare setting. So we didn't have a population of no protection versus FFRs versus EHMRs. That would be a completely different study and require completely different I IRB approval levels. I also answered that question a little bit lower because we did not have um, we did not have uh, the ability to we you know during a pandemic setting to ever have anybody in our hospital setting be without respiratory protection mm -hmm. in these settings. Yeah, we don't we don't want to put the workers at a risk like that. Was there any thought about asking patients their perceptions of workers who wore FFRs versus EHMRs? Uh, did they have any trouble communicating with the workers or more anxiety when a worker actually wore an EHMR versus an FFR? So that was not addressed in this particular study because, again, we were looking at just comfort and feasibility of elastomerics. However, that is being addressed in upcoming studies that are still getting off the ground. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we will have a proper answer to that question. Next question, did any of the studies evaluate or compare the experience of healthcare workers using FFRs for the same factors, or is there any kind of evaluation plan for this study in the future? Um, as far as I know, we do not have any, as far as I know personally, there is nothing in the works for FFRs versus EHMRs specifically. Um, we were looking in this study to an extent of 
current EHMR use versus prior FFR use and opinions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I mean, we, I mean, we could elaborate on that a little bit. I mean, we didn't really okay. show the study findings for that, but it is in a manuscript that probably will be submitted soon. Um, but we did look at. We asked workers, you know, because they were all experienced, most of them wearing the N95s, um, the disposable N95s, and and we asked them to compare the comfort between the EHMR and the N95. And for a lot of the metrics, the, the, the measurements, that they felt that the EHMR was more comfortable. Now, the EHMR isn't super comfortable. I mean, we're not like saying this is like the slam dunk. Um, but they did find it more comfortable, I would say, overall than they found the N95. So there's some promising findings there, I think, maybe for some workers who are really struggling with the N95, that perhaps the EHMR would be a, a, a better alternative. But that's just, you know, that's their recalling the these discomfort um, metrics uh, for the N95. You know, they hadn't worn it for like three months. So anyway, I'll just end there, but but yeah, the more work needs to be done with that. Um, okay, so we did have a question. Did the hospitals that had essential disinfection station use the same wipes? Uh, yes, so all three sites used about the same wipes. The, I think Oxivir 1 versus Oxivir TB, there's very little difference. Um, both types of wipes have the 0.5% H2O2 as a disinfectant. So that was one thing we made sure was the same across all sites. There was also a comment on full face piece respirators being used with an APF of 10. I will say full face piece respirators actually have an APF of 50, uh, not 10, so that it is a higher protection factor. As for the rest of your comments, um, you see Mosha would allow this according to a footnote that I cannot speak on, but I will just note that it is an APF of 50, not 10, if that impacts your decision at all. Are there any other questions that were missed in chat or that people have for this time period? Okay. Did any site go beyond the disinfecting wipe approach and the full disassembly cleaning as most EHMR IFUs contain? So the disinfection wipe was to be like a between patient or after doffing uh, disinfection so that you can continue about your workday without a wet uh, elastomeric respirator. At the end of every shift, the worker was supposed to disassemble and do a full clean uh, with respect to the inf manufacturer's instructions. Are there any other questions? Um, has soiling with artificial soils, mucus, blood, etc., been considered? Are you had uh, poor disinfection in a lab? setting? Is that what you mean? Okay. So I think that's what's meant. I think okay. uh, we've done this in many other scenarios, but we haven't done it with the respirator. And I think it would have to be in a laboratory situation because I think the inhalation, um, you know, tr yeah, oh, for surgical. We have not done that. We've done many of, of fake blood and mucus and stool on other uh, research projects, but not in this one. And we did do um, across our site in Emory, we did do a lab based study, lab based studies looking at um, inactive pathogens um, that were placed on the respirator and then examined the effectiveness of disinfection using various wipes. And I think we actually presented that. That's probably sitting out there on YouTube. We presented that three or four weeks ago, and those papers are in process. So. That presentation is not yet uploaded. We're finishing okay. the clearance process for it, but it okay. should be uploaded soon. Any other questions? If not, I will wrap that up for the, for the morning. Thank you all for joining us. And have, have a good rest of your morning.